Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Janis Joplin endured heartbreaking loneliness before her tragic death. The Texan who yearned to get stoned, stay happy and have a good time was haunted by self-doubt and insecurities, despite her fame as a sought-after rock star. Why was Janis Joplin desperately lonely behind her public image? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Janis Joplin, often referred to as the Queen of Rock and Roll, is best remembered for her rebellious lifestyle, her psychedelic Porsche, her free-flowing fashion sense and above all her distinctive voice. No conversation about musical icons is complete without mentioning Janis Joplin. Her career may have been short, but her mark on the music scene inspired countless other performers. Songwriting talent and vocal ability aside, tales of Joplin's hard partying lifestyle ensure that she lived up to the rock and roll stereotype. Breaking new ground for women in rock music, Joplin rose to fame in the late 1960s and became known for her powerful blues-inspired vocals. Rule breaker, screamer, artist, addict, a strong, uncompromising, sexually liberated woman. These descriptions and far more fit Janis Joplin well. They also risk reducing her to a mere symbol, a blues rock star just as memorable for burning out as blazing brightly. She was a flesh and blood being, a complicated, contradictory young woman, coming of age at the height of the social upheaval and possibility of 1960s America. She was a dutiful daughter caught between her father's quiet intellectual nonconformity and her mother's somewhat more traditional views on religion, homemaking and societal expectations. Janice was a teenager punished by her suburban Texas peers for daring to dress comfortably, drink, swear and tussle as much as any boy and eventually enjoy open, casual sex with men and women. She was a budding artist unsure if the traditional domesticity of married life would be more fulfilling than deeply exploring her creativity. Joplin had a meteoric career, covering her music as much as her personal struggles to soothe her pain over various rejections. Even as she eventually rejects many of her friends in pursuit of greater fame and musical transcendence. Joplin was born on January 19, 1943, in the racially segregated town of Port Arthur, Texas, to Seth Ward Joplin, an engineer, and Dorothy Bonita East, a registrar at a business college. She had two younger siblings, Michael and Laura. She was a tomboy who knew early she was different. She was often bullied and ostracised in high school. Other kids would often taunt her and call her names like Creep, Pig and Freak. Her early belief in desegregation set her apart from her high school peers, and they often teased her for being different. As a result, Joplin would frequently skip classes, attending only what she needed in order to graduate. She became friends with guys who shared her love for music, and this flared up her passion for singing. Her proud stance on segregation was linked to her love of blues music, particularly the music of iconic singers Billie Holiday and Bessie Smith. She graduated from high school in 1960. She did not complete her college education in spite of attending several institutions. Even before she got famous, Joplin was getting a reputation as a drug user. She was known in the San Francisco area for using speed, heroin and drinking. Joplin was engaged once to a man she'd met in San Francisco, Peter de Blanc. He'd asked for her father's permission to marry her, and Joplin and her mother had already started planning the wedding when he broke it off. Why? We don't know, but maybe it's for the best. Joplin expressed some disinterest a few years later in just being a secretary or being a wife like all the other women she knew at the time. In 1965, Joplin's health was rapidly deteriorating due to her drug use. She was severely underweight to the point that her friends thought she looked skeletal. They really thought it was best that she go home to recover and hopefully get clean. They even threw her a bus fare party so she could afford the trip back to Texas. When Joplin first returned to Texas from San Francisco in 1965, she did actually get clean. She stopped using drugs and alcohol and enrolled in school again, this time studying anthropology at Lamar University. Even though she'd given up drugs and alcohol for the time being, 
Joplin hadn't given up singing. She'd still travel out to Austin, Texas to sing and play guitar. However, the conventional life was not for her. Her first big break came in 1966 when she joined the psychedelic rock band Big Brother and The Holding Company. The band signed several deals and she gave several hits, such as Down On Me, Bye Bye Baby and Call On Me as the lead vocalist. Cheap Thrills, the band's second album, became an instant hit and topped the charts in the US. Despite her success, she parted ways with the band in 1968 due to their lack of professionalism. In June of the following year, the band's performance at the Monterey Festival, birthplace of the Flower Power movement, was a triumph. The audience was awestruck by Joplin's incredible possessed performance and husky voice. It's a supreme emotional and physical experience, she said at the time. After the concert, Big Brother were offered a contract with Columbia Records. But Janis Joplin's heart was no longer in it. She left the band at the end of that year and set up Cosmic Blues Band, whose vibes were a mix of funk, blues, soul and pop. On August 16, 1969, Janis Joplin and the Cosmic Blues Band performed at Woodstock. Back to her old addictions, the singer used a mix of cocaine and alcohol to calm her nerves. The explosive cocktail brought on a poor performance, so much so that Joplin asked the festival's organisers to leave it out of the video. The Cosmic Blues Band split in December 1969 and Joplin set up the Full Tilt Boogie Band in early 1970. While recording the first album, Pearl, she suffered from a cocaine overdose in a Los Angeles hotel. Like many other female singers of the era, Janice's feisty public image was at odds with her real personality. The book Love, Janice, written by her sister, has done much to further the reassessment of her life and work and reveals the private Janice to have been a highly intelligent, articulate, shy and sensitive woman who was devoted to her family. The part of Joplin's popularity was that she wasn't pretty. During the up-and-coming women's movement, she was a champion for every woman who didn't look like a supermodel. I've always thought that Janice was a symbol of liberation for every plain girl, who had about given up trying to look like those gussied up, quaffered young singers of the time. For those young women, her sudden enormous universal popularity seemed to be like a violent eruption, blasting out from their cosmetic frustration. Yay, now we've got a champion! Janis Joplin rejected the accepted norms of how female musicians were supposed to behave and appear. She wore her hair naturally instead of perfectly coiffed in a beehive and wore informal clothing instead of tailored sequined gowns. And most importantly, she adopted a sexual persona on stage, acting as a woman who put her own pleasure first. Through songs such as Get It While You Can, Joplin became the figurehead of the second wave feminist movement. In this song, Joplin discusses the prevailing view that women should postpone pleasure until they are married and then should put off professional fulfillment for the sake of their children. Instead, Joplin advocated for women to embrace their sexual needs. Hey, hey, get it while you can. Don't you turn your back on love. Joplin was upfront about female sexual pleasure, societal double standards and the power and strength of women. Joplin's larger-than-life personality, charismatic sexuality, laid-back sense of style, whiskey-laced stage antics and full-bodied performances may not share exactly the same artistic DNA as contemporary music's tastemakers and trendsetters, but she was indisputably revolutionary in her time and she paved the way for many of the female musicians who followed. As most of her fans know, Janis Joplin was a charter member of the 27 Club, a list of rock musicians who died at that age. Janis's off and on love affair with various kinds of dope clearly contributed both to her roller coaster life and to her death, which, despite rumours of suicide and even murder, is described in excruciating detail as an accidental overdose on heroin. Joplin died on October 4, 1970, her lifeless body found on the floor of a room. Her death was officially ruled as an overdose, and over decades it has never been questioned. Several other drug users who used the same strain of heroin overdosed in the same week too, which seemingly provided ironclad proof. Come on, come on and take it. Take another little piece of my heart now, baby. 
sung by Janis Joplin, belongs in any compilation of the popular music of the 1960s. Those of us who remember the original recording tend to hear it as a direct expression of the singer's emotional experience. She went into the studio that day. She loved working in the studio. She had a great relationship with her band, her final band. They got along wonderfully and she was really happy with the way the sessions were going. They had a routine that after being in the studio they would go to Barney's Beanery for a few drinks and some laughs. After a busy crazy day she went to her hotel room and she found herself all alone. She had a guy in her life at that point and a woman. Neither of them showed up that night. They were supposed to and neither one of them did and so that's when she ended up doing heroin. It turned out to be super strong stuff that was so much purer than what she was used to and she had stopped using four or five months before. Her tolerance was down. It was just a tragic mistake. She was so excited about how the sessions were going and so eager for the future. The Queen of Psychedelic Soul was found dead. Her body was found by her road manager John Cook who wondered why Joplin had not emerged from her hotel. What's really tragic is that there was one guy in her life who really loved her. He was off travelling the world and she had been really wanting to be with him. She didn't realise it but there was a letter waiting for her in the mailbox at the hotel where she was staying. She never got to see that letter. In a new book Peggy Cassiter, a close friend of the late Janis Joplin, offers insight into her claims that the blues singer's death was not actually caused by a drug overdose. Joplin's longtime friend Caserta, who claims to have slept with the singer multiple times and used recreational drugs with her, said she arrived at the scene shortly after the police did. Although she couldn't get as close a look as she wanted, the detail she saw led her to believe her own theory on the icon's tragic death. I saw her foot sticking out at the end of the bed. She was lying with cigarettes in one hand and change in the other. For years it bothered me. How could she have overdosed and then walked out to the lobby and walked back? Something is wrong here, she said. She postulates that Joplin tripped over the hotel's thick shag carpet, fell onto the bedside table head first and then broke her nose, which could have led to asphyxiation and eventual death as the blood backed up in her throat. In an era when rock and roll was dominated by the likes of the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin broke through as one of the top female singers of the 1960s with her potent, soulful vocals and relatable personality. Though on the surface Joplin inspired millions of female fans with her independent style and ferociously confident stage presence, off stage the singer used her hard partying to mask an aching desire to find a companion. If you liked this video don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here and if you want to support my work please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Janis Joplin? Joplin opened doors for female musicians and her impact can be seen in the leading female musicians of today.